Hello, and thank you for joining us for the virtual summit presentation, presentation, Technology as Part of the Teaching Toolkit in First Year English. My name is Hannah Bullard, and I'm an Educational Courseware Specialist here at Hawks Learning. Our speaker today is Professor Nick Britton of Lake Michigan College. Professor Britton is an English instructor and serves as the Chair of the Communication and Foreign Language Departments at Lake Michigan College. He has overseen the development of hybrid courses using Zoom and created several literature courses that utilize emerging technologies. He finds these tech-based methods work well with his approach to literature that emphasizes context and other post-structuralist ideas. In addition, he is currently working on the new virtual reality lab at Lake Michigan College's Niles campus, which will enable several exciting possibilities for students and instructors. We are excited to have you here with us today. If you have any questions during the webinar, please enter those into the Q&A box located on the panel at the top or bottom of your screen, and we will address them at the end of the talk. On that note, I will hand it over to the presenter. Hey there, thanks, I appreciate it. Um, so uh, just before I get going, I, I have somewhat modified uh, the presentation just a bit, just to be a little bit more relevant to uh, the incredibly changing circumstances that we're dealing with now. So. Um, rather than tying specifically to like a, a course outcome uh, that we would have in say English 101, um, I'm kind of going a little bit more just how tech can be used to reach sort of any of your students really. Um, it's so trying to be a little bit more general so it's not just um, focused English, although I'm happy to take questions um, for um, how to apply things. And I think that's probably, I'm going to try to maybe get through the, the webinar a little bit quicker um, so that way we can get to that time of well, how do I do this all of a sudden because all of a sudden everybody is going to you know, who, who knew that the, the education system was going to shut down, basically, um, and now we have to suddenly live on the internet. Um, so that's kind of going to be the, the focus today. Um, so um, apologies if you're here to look at like specific outcomes. That's not really uh, going to be quite as much my emphasis at this point, although I will bring that in, but I've, I've kind of lowered that um, a little bit so we could bring in some other um, other topics about what can happen. Um, and I took, I left some fun stuff in too, because um, we can't be all doom and gloom. So. Um, but um, so anyway, so here we go. Um, so uh, this is uh, uh, the name of the presentation, Turning the New into Now, um, Crossing Over and Teching Your Teaching. Um, so just ways that uh, different technologies that are out there um, that certainly now that you have plenty of time uh, at home, at least we're not on the road as much. Um, if you're like me and if you're, I'm in the state of Michigan, of course, and we've uh, went fully online for at least a couple weeks, um, although um, my guess is it's going to be fully online for a little bit longer. Um, than that. And I think from what I understand, a lot of states have gone that route. So, so of course, um, the last thing that maybe you want to hear right now um, is another presentation about tech in the classroom. Um, on one hand, you uh, kind of need it right now, but on the other hand, uh, some instructors are probably just getting to the point that like we get it, you know, online in the classroom. Uh, however, uh, what if, just hypothetically speaking, what if something terrible did happen um, and we suddenly had to switch to online learning? Um, just what if? Um, and this is actually for the state of Michigan, this is our second time um, in, in a second year in a row uh, where something has happened where we went to online, where of course now we have uh, COVID-19. Um, and then last year, if you're from the north, you'll remember the polar vortex, um, where schools were closed, um, at least my school was closed for two weeks um, straight, um, because uh, the polar vortex, which is a particular type of blizzard, came down and pretty much froze the state of Michigan. When temperatures get down below negative 20, which, which they stayed for about two weeks, um, you just can't go outside. You know, you, you have to cancel school. But of course, you know, you've been hearing about this for a while. There's a new LMS, there's a new thing, some tech stuff. And what I love is when I go to those presentations, and I imagine everybody's had this experience um, where you go and the administrators um, are, are giving a presentation about how great this technology is, and uh, it doesn't work. <clears throat> like even the presentation software itself doesn't work. This literally happened twice this semester uh, to me, this semester, where we would go in to hear about, about something and they couldn't make the speakers work or they couldn't, the internet would crash or something just, and it's, it's sad, it's kind of hilarious if you have the right, um, the right mindset. Uh, but of course, we're gonna just adopt everything, right? I mean, it's, it's all available, you just, they tell you the stuff exists and you just grab it and, and you go forward. I'm uh, being sarcastic, of course, that no, we can't grab everything. Okay, not everything, not every piece of technology. Um, even if it's very useful for somebody, might not be for you, right? So, I mean, we have to figure out what's, what tools are available, uh, what jobs are we trying to accomplish. But uh, it's sort of like if you're, uh, it almost seems like sometimes where you're trying to hang a picture 
and they take you to Home Depot and show you a chainsaw. You say, well, this is a tool, right? You can hang a picture with tools. I'm like, well, no, I actually need a hammer and a nail. Um, uh, you know, maybe one of those little strips or something. I don't need everything in the entire catalog of technology ever to figure out how to connect with my students. So that being said, I do think that we have um, some stuff that's relatively low cost, quite a bit, most of it's free, honestly, um, that uh, can actually really help you. You know, that, that it's gonna be useful um, for what you're doing. Uh, once we do get back to normal, whatever that's gonna look like, um, hopefully this is stuff that not, is, is not just for disasters, it's not just for uh, when the system breaks down, it's for actually, uh, can we improve? Can we make our education system better? Uh, maybe we will come out of this and we'll have a new perspective and we'll have a new understanding of how, uh, what technology can do. So things we're gonna look at, uh, very simply drive, which some of you are gonna say, oh, drive, of course, it's, it's the cloud, right? I mean, that, they know all about drive. So some people, that's just a staple that they already have in their toolkit. It's just something that they already do. For those of you who don't, um, drive is gonna be super useful, right? That is something that um, I'll sometimes have instructors say, well, no, I only do with paper. How do I possibly distribute things? How do I save things if I can't get to my filing cabinet? Well, drive, we'll do that. Zoom, who I can't tell you how much I wish I bought a whole bunch of Zoom stock a month ago, um, because Zoom is everywhere. Um, that was something where literally like last fall, if I mentioned it to somebody, another instructor, there was like a 50-50 chance they'd ever heard of it, right? And now all of a sudden, it's everywhere. I mean, it's just, it's, it's the, it's, it's everywhere. And then of course, something that we're not able to do right now, uh, not very well, but virtual reality. So once we can get back in the room with each other, then we can start doing that VR stuff. So that's what we'll finish with. So this is what I have, um, starting with Drive. If you choose only one thing to add to your toolkit, if, you, if you're not using an online cloud uh, software system for storage, this is something you need to look into. Personally, I use Google Drive. Um, because it's just handy. I have it on my phone. It's free. Um, it, it works really nicely. Um, so that's just the one that I use. It's super portable. It's probably the one your students are most familiar with. Um, other ones, you might have heard of Dropbox. Dropbox works too. Um, I think it needs a little bit more, more steps, I think, to use Dropbox, but it, it works too. Microsoft has um, OneDrive, um, which is very similar. Um, so there's Microsoft Online, so it's a thing that are, um, that are available to you too. Um, but what I do is I have these uh, folders, and you can just create these uh, in, your, in your Drive account. And I'm sorry for some of you, this is painful review, but for other people. And so I just have folders according to, say, this is my English 204 class. That's Masterpieces of British Lit. And so, British Lit 2, rather. And so I'll um, just open that up, and that's where I have, I can't open it here because it's just a picture, but, um, but that's where I have all my files, all my presentations, all my notes, everything related to that course. Um, this is English 208. Um, it's... Uh, uh, everything I have that's literature interpretation. Um, and so on, these are all the courses I teach. This is just chair stuff, you know, that sort of administratory chair things that, um, that I have. Um, and so it's, uh, and then the VR lab, of course, that I'm working on at the Niles campus. It's just a really handy way. Uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you know that the cloud exists, but you're not quite sure what it is, it's, it's called the cloud because it's sort of like a giant, like, office slash flash drive slash filing cabinet that sort of flies around over your head that's sort of always there like a cloud would and um, that's at least how i like to think of it and so these file these folders think of those as like different filing cabinets in a, in a big room and then within those filing cabinets are things you know documents uh, whatever you want to have and so you just store them in there keeps it nice and tidy um i, I know a lot of instructors who their uh, office computers where they were storing all their stuff uh, well, the office is locked. You can't get to it now. So now what if you, if you saved it on your hard drive or you saved it in your filing cabinet at the office, you can't even get in. The buildings are locked. If you had it on here, you can access this from anywhere. Um, so it's really nice if I go on a trip or something like that. You, I can still get a hold of it. If a student asks me a question at a conference, I can still get a hold of the documents. It's really nice stuff, uh, really easy to use, and it's free. Um, so, um, and this is the presentation about why it's... Uh, how does it work? It's just, it's, it's stored at different locations around the world, um, but it's accessible to you anytime you have uh, an internet connection, um, which we're starting to see the value of internet connections right now, the value of having this stuff available. What's nice too is that, uh, at least with, with most of the stuff, it's shareable. So if you have a student that's, uh, maybe your learning management system is not very good, or maybe it crashes, you can still share documents and they can, they can share it with you too. My suggestion, if you're interested in this and want to know more, we can do certainly Q&A at the end of this, um, but also, uh, 
quite frankly, YouTube. Um, just Google up how to use Google Drive, um, click on videos, and YouTube will have like innumerable videos about how to make it work. Um, totally free. It's it's just an absolute lifesaver. Um, if you've ever done that thing where you have your flash drive and you leave it in the uh, the classroom computer, and then about halfway home you realize, oh shoot, I forgot to grab my flash drive, and you got to go all the way back. You don't have to worry about all this. Um, you can literally walk in the classroom. I, most of the time, I walk in the classroom with my hands completely empty because everything is stored here. I just I don't have to even worry about carrying stuff around or forgetting it, which I'll inevitably do. Um, so. Now, um, it does allow you to keep your syllabi, your assignments, everything organized, and it's all there. You don't have to like retype anything. You can't lose it. Google's not going to lose it for you. Um, if you're like me, you lose everything, right? English instructors, we tend to be particular. I think we're the most absent-minded um, of all the instructors. You can update stuff. And I think probably the most useful is the printer. You don't have to go to the printer anymore um, because you can just share this stuff with your students. And so um, you might have noticed that the, the printer um, uh, in your office, in your uh, department wing, uh, sometimes it's broken, right? It just simply doesn't work. Strangely enough, other printers around campus tend to work just beautifully, um, work fine. Um, but the ones the instructors use, there's always a line, it's always out of ink, it's out of paper. For some reason, it's printing everything all funky. You don't have to worry about it. It's all here in, in, uh, uh, in Drive. Uh, and then also with attachments. We send all these attachments around and we have you ever worked on a project with somebody and you sent them an attachment with your updates? They then worked on their version and sent it to you, but they crossed paths. So now the stuff that has your notes on it doesn't have their notes on it. And now you have to figure it all out and update stuff with this. It just tracks everything right there in the original document. So you don't have to send anything to anybody. You don't have to worry about, oh, I brought the wrong document to the meeting or whatever. So um, how do you use it? Um, if you have a, a cell phone, you probably already have an account, honestly. Um, just and if you don't have one, then you can just go to Google and sign up, and it's free. Um, you just sign into Google, click on Drive, and start playing around. You can't break it. Um, this is a really perfect time to just go and explore. There's the videos how to use it, or just create your account and go in there and make up some dummy documents, um, and just play with it. And if you make up something, you can delete it. You can share it with you know somebody else who's goofing around with this stuff, um, and it's it's just awesome uh, because it's there's no risk. Right, it's just it's totally available to you. Now, moving on to Zoom. Um, this is, of course, the one that's been getting all the press lately. Um, now, it's a little bit more intense. It's a little bit trickier to use than Drive is, um, or any of the cloud software, really. But it's really nice to have available. OK, it's a really important tool. And I think that we're finding that out now. Think of it sort of like Skype for academics. Um, so you, if you ever, um, you know, at the holidays, you want to see the relatives who aren't couldn't make it to dinner, they're in a different part of the country or something. Um, you Skype with them on your cell phone or on your tablet or computer, or whatever. This is like that, um, but it's you know, it has a lot more functionality to it. Um, now there's two levels of uh, membership to it. There's the free version, which is actually pretty nice. Um, it works for a free version. It's pretty good. Um, it gives you 45 minute meetings. It allows a fair amount of functionality, um, and it works. It does. It doesn't take up a lot of space on your computer. Um, Honestly, if you just go to zoom.us and download it, you're up and running in a few minutes. Um, you know, uh, certainly your students, if they have really any internet ability at all, um, they can probably go to this website and get this thing going. Um, it is not a trick. You, you don't need IT to set this up for you. Um, you can really get this going really quickly and easily. Um, you can talk to students. We're using Zoom now, now of course. Um, you can talk to students, share your screen, share videos, whatever. Um, and so, uh, I schedule a lot of hybrid and blended classes um, that allow students to maintain direct contact with me. Um, but what's really cool is that first off, well, let's say a you know, plague moves through the entire country and we can't uh, be in the same room with each other anymore. But it's also useful at other times um, where, because uh, I have a lot of instruct a lot of colleagues who are saying, well, what about my students who um, don't do as well with uh, uh, online learning? Or what if they uh, don't have the good internet access? Well, true, that's something that's definitely a consideration. However, you also have students who they say, well, what if they have kids running around the background? True point, that what if they do have kids running around the background? However, they have those kids anyways, right? They're gonna have those kids even for face-to-face -face classes. I wonder, there's, I haven't seen any good data on this, but how many students are restricted by their schedule because they can't get babysitters, they can't get childcare. Um, maybe they can't get out of work on time to get to campus or something like that. But with Zoom, you can 
hold a class that way that that student who does have children to worry about, um, who can't just you know go uh, be at the campus, can still log in with Zoom and, and function pretty well, um, get a pretty good class experience out of it. And then yeah, maybe the kid interrupts sometimes or something like that. But frankly, if they're not sure what's happening with their children anyways, they don't have a good childcare system, they're probably worried about that anyways. Those students who maybe have to be in contact with somebody could still have a good class experience by using Zoom. Uh, transportation, students who have to rely on public transportation or buses or what have you. Um, our bus system in uh, the part of the country, I'm in Southwest Michigan, we're down. If you're from Michigan or the, anybody, you know anybody from Michigan, we use our hand as a map. We're down here, it's not populated enough to really have like a consistent, um, we don't have subways or um, consistent bus travel. So they have to call basically, call for rides. It's a, it's a bus system that you call for and they can pick it up. It's not very reliable. Um, so no offense to anybody who happens to be in this presentation that works for this bus system. But they, they might be late to class um, and they, they want to go. They're, they're, they're determined they want to be there. Transportation might be the bigger issue than internet access. Most people in this country have pretty good internet access. Most people do. Not everybody, but most people do. And I wonder if we were to compare that data, do people have consistent internet access or a consistent ride? Depending on the region, that, that internet access might be easier to get um, than a car is. So it's something to think about. Um, and so how does it work? Um, I can show you this video here. What I would maybe do is just provide it. Um, I can, uh, I guess I'll put this on YouTube. I can show you just a little bit about how simple it is to, you guys probably know we won't to play the video. But if anybody wants the link to this, just let me know um, that it does exist. Um, it's, I think this video is like two minutes long or something like that. It's not very long at all. And it sets you up so that you can download Zoom, which you obviously know how to do, but how to even record the meetings. I think that's really nice too. And I can't stand that picture of me. So I'm going to bounce back to this one. Uh, those thumbnails, right? Um, but uh, uh, but no, so let's say you, uh, uh, if you're like me, say you go to a math class. And I remember in high school and college, and I would go to, say, algebra or geometry, or just pick any math class that happened on a local. And it would make total sense. The presentation would make apps. I would see how to do the quadratic equation or whatever. And it would, the instructor's up there, and he or she's explaining it to me, and I get it. Okay, boy, I know how to solve for X or whatever it is that equation does. And then I would get home, and I try to do my homework, and it was like, now what? It was like somebody came through and just, my brain was a whiteboard and they just wiped it clean. It's just gibberish to me now. Because I was limited to just my memories. If you record your classroom, so like what we're doing here, you can record it and then the student can, can watch it and go back and find, okay, how did this work? It's almost like you're there um, with the student. They can watch just those pieces that they need to review so it starts to make sense to them again. In this way, uh, recorded that the, the online learning actually has an advantage over face-to-face uh, uh, -face education. I think that was a big thing that we're starting to deal with now that it almost seems like well, we're, we're downgrading when we go to online, that face-to-face -face is sort of ideal, and we've taken a step down to online, when really, if we can see our courses properly, online actually is equal to and sometimes superior to face-to-face. Um, -to -face. It's nice to, to take the strengths from both of them. Um, and that's where, where these blended courses and hybrid courses can come in, where you do record the, the presentation, the lecture, the interaction or whatever, and the student can watch it again later on. So it's like, it's, it's a really nice benefit. And if you want the video, the, the link to this, I can send it to you. Um, but uh, we, can just, we can just move on for now. Um, so um, you can, like I say, you can have it for uh, uh, sometimes even stuff that's maybe not as interesting. You know, in, in English class, we have to worry about uh, uh, APA citation which frankly, if it's eight in the morning, who wants to listen to me talk about APA citation for 45 minutes? I mean, even I'm gonna get just dreadfully bored by this. Record it, do something more exciting for class. Just I'll record the video, put it up on Canvas. That's our learning management system. We do something more discussion-based, something a little bit more interactive in class. And I tell the students, okay, you did this, you're awake. Tonight, maybe tomorrow, whatever, when you're more awake, then watch that video about APA citation. Hawks does something, so I, because I use Hawks, I have to, have to do that chapter and say, the video I made and what Hawks uses, there you go. That's if Between those two, you can probably pick up most of APA citation uh, just outside of class. And then you can come to class tomorrow or in two days or whenever we have class again with questions. So we can do with things, specific issues about precisely where does that parentheses go. Um, but then we're not just sitting with it in class and worrying about Because after 30 minutes, there's no way they're paying attention um, to, to where APA citation goes. So you combine things like Hawks with uh, these videos and they can watch it when they're a little bit more awake um, you know some students can take in 30 minutes of data on that some students it's more like five or ten minutes so they can always pause it go do something else i tell them if you get to where your brain is wandering pause it go take a walk go 
watch a YouTube video, do whatever it is that wakes you up, unpause, come back and finish the presentation. If they were to do that while I was sitting in class, that's not going to work, obviously. I don't want you to suddenly say, yeah, I'm bored. I'm going to go do something else. Well, at home, feel free to be bored. Feel free to come back whenever it is that you're ready to go learn this stuff. We'll do something a little bit more exciting, I'm a little bit more uh, dynamic. I'm in the classroom setting. So um, uh, it's so this is sort of like a, I just sort of reviewing that. I sometimes get excited about this, get on the wrong slide. But um, so yeah, like I say, and so for for us, for those of us in the English department, we find some of these literary concepts pretty. We get excited about these sorts of things. But not all of my students are English majors. Most of my students are not English majors. They're only going to get so excited about learning about post-structural theory. Okay, well, go home. And then if you can, what I tell them to do is watch those, those videos while doing something else almost. It's, I know this is dangerous. This is risky. But hey, watch the post-structural video and then go watch Rick and Morty or whatever it is kids are watching these days. See if you can apply this video to that. Maybe go back and forth. I'm with math classes. Say, okay, go home and Watch part of your math and then see if you can find something realistic to associate it with. You have to juggle your bills or you have to calculate textbook costs or whatever it is. See if you can kind of put this video in a context that's different from sitting in a classroom, put it in your actual real life experience. And so it takes learning away from just that one spot, that one building, um, that, that structure that we've created the school. And it moves, it allows them to move it into their bedroom, into their living room, um, wherever it is that they're watching the videos at. Um, and, uh, do other stuff, you know, they can sort of associate learning with their, their basic life. Um, and so I'll mute it, but I'll, I'll show just sort of what one of these videos uh, might look like. So this one's about um, uh, how to conduct research, right? Because I think that's going to be so important these days, right? Um, I mean, how much false information is out there um, about uh, uh, the coronavirus and, and the things that are, uh, well, why can't I just Google stuff? Why can't I just trust what, well, my, my friend said this on Facebook, and he's really smart. Um, so I'll just, I'll just go Google it. You know, my friend said that's true. And if I go to this crazy website, I go to freedom eagle backslash Facebook dot, you know, US, then that's probably legit or dot net or whatever. I'm um, sure. Um, and so, yeah, you, we can sort of explain not to necessarily trust just whatever Google says. Google's not bad, um, but I mean, it's, it's not necessarily the something we want to just put a whole bunch of effort into. And so you can kind of see what this, um, of course, then we get a library database, which even that, think about how logging into library databases, how, how complex sometimes there's multiple layers of logging in. And a student might get home and say, well, look, I tried, couldn't do it, I quit. Uh, well, if you put these videos together, you can say, look, I'm going to walk you through this logging in step, step by step, and how to get you right in. There's no excuse. Now, so that's, that's Zoom, that's the ability to record lectures, and some of the benefits um, of applying this stuff, even after the quarantine is lifted. These are ways that you can still use this um, that I think will be useful later on, um, even once we can be back together face to face, face to face. And of course, uh, virtual reality, um, which um, is something I've been working with quite a bit lately. Um, this will show you just while I'm talking about this, uh, this video be going, it won't be any sound. Um, but this was, uh, uh, this is what our lab basically looks like. Um, and this guy here is actually, um, he's one of our uh, students and he was floating around inside of uh, uh, arteries. I'm um, inside a blood system. That's me talking. Let's get past that. You get the gist of what I look like. Um, but uh, um, so, uh, so she's over there at Google Earth. She's playing around, flying around. Um, and then there are these students are talking to see if we can get more uh, about what people are actually doing. But um, yeah, there we go. And so this one's uh, really nice because it, uh, um, you're, you're actually taking on the role of somebody who's handicapped uh, going into a business meeting. Um, and that person, who, what would it be like to be handicapped? And maybe the, the, uh, impressions that people have of you. And so you can actually, rather than just reading about it and say, hey, people who are handicapped are sometimes people are condescending to them. Well, I don't think anybody would deny that, but now what if you were actually in that person? What if you were actually the person in the wheelchair? What's that experience gonna be like? I think it's gonna really be a lot more dynamic than just reading about it. This lab here was several thousand dollars to put together. Okay, it's, it's, it's going to be um, tricky. You can't just like write a check and have that happen, right? Um, but there, there are other options. We'll get to those in just a second. Some of my favorite things that we can use that don't worry, you don't have to have a $50,000 grant um, to get that thing going. We didn't either. We got it going for about 10 years. Um, but um, uh, uh, some of my favorite uh, systems are uh, Google Earth, um, which allows you to go really anywhere on the planet, which right now, once you're getting that cabin fever, Google Earth probably sounds pretty fun right now. Um, uh, now, my units are locked up right now at the school, but um, I do have this Oculus Quest, which I'll talk about in a few minutes here, where we can still take field trips. 
when I think about that, I think that being locked up in our houses, we can't go places. Um, the idea of being able to just get out and see the world sounds pretty appealing. However, even once we can go places, think about how many of your students are low income. Um, how many students who, I use this in one of my classes where we, we have them, uh, I have them work on where would they like to go on a vacation? Um, and it sounds real simple, right? So, well, of course, that's, that's an easy first one. Uh, and it is my first essay um, we do in 101. But then uh, I have them price it out. I have them visit a few places and see what the rest of the world looks like. And then they say, well, I'll never have that trip. It cost $5,000. I'll never have $5,000. Because we teach a lot of low-income folks around here. And I'll tell them, no, um, that's not true. You very easily could pay for this. You could very easily get this trip someday. If you want to go see what Iceland looks like, or you want to go see what the Grand Canyon or Paris or whatever you pick, if you stay in school and you work hard, that's going to be something that's a possibility for you. Now, it's, it sounds Pollyanna. It sounds you know, maybe naive. But know that if you do focus, and you are doing the right thing right now by being in school and trying to, to increase your, your uh, socioeconomic status, these places are possible for you to go to. They're not just pictures. Um, and so for a student who I live pretty close to Chicago, some students, it's two hours away to get to Chicago. Some of them, that's as far as they've ever gone. Some haven't gone that far. Um, some have been to maybe South Bend, Indiana, just across the street from us. And that's about it. To them, that's a vacation. They made it to Olive Garden, and that, that was a big trip for them. Tell them, no, the whole world exists. You can go to all these different places, but you have to want it. You have to be willing to put in um, that time and think about, and also think about these other people who live there, that um, the world isn't just your neighborhood, right? That the world is this massive place, and you can see at least a little bit of it. You can get a taste of it by using these devices. We also have these really interesting uh, immersive texts. I pair this guy, I won't go through too much detail, but um, at this one, you're, you're uh, basically gonna have this robot. I pair this up with Hamlet. Um, where he's, you're, you're in a, a basement, basically, is what it looks like. And um, he explains to you the meaning of life from his nihilistic cyborg point of view. It um, turns out he was created to be a servant, and he loved his family, and then they cast him aside. Um, and now he's, it's very scary. Um, but I think it works beautifully with Hamlet, with your family sort of betraying you. Um, Vestige is a nice one because it's um, super immersive. It's a bit immersive. It's a woman who lost her husband. And she, um, this is a true story, by the way. It's totally true. And she's like 35 and her husband died of sort of just a, a heart attack. It's just one of those things that happened. And she tells the story of their relationship while these sort of images, it's animated, but images of her and him together um, appear around you as you move around the room. And it's really interesting. Um, you will sob openly. When I, I was so happy I was alone when I did that one because um, I wasn't crying, but it turns out I have an allergic reaction to really sad stories. I'm in mean, my eyes water quite a bit. Um, really sad stuff. In memory, it's about a guy who's uh, losing his sight. And it's, again, a true story. And the VR tries to replicate what it's like to be blind, which, because it's not just blackness, right? And it's something I hadn't thought about very much until I put this on. You can still sort of sense the world around you. And the virtual reality tries to replicate that. And then traveling while black, which is fascinating. I'm going to put this one on for just a second. Um, this is uh, based on the book. Um, it's a documentary. Um, and it shows what it's like to. Um, for people who were uh, in controls, right? Uh, but for, for African Americans who were traveling uh, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s in the United States, what they had to do, um, where they had to go, and these guides that they would appeal to, um, to where it was safe for them to travel. Um, again, as, as a Caucasian male in the North, um, I can read about it, sure, but if I put those goggles on and I'm actually sitting at these diners, I'm sitting on these buses and on these trains in the back, of course. It gives me a perspective that I never, I just, you just can't get from a book um, that uh, to actually be able to see if we could find something that's, that really shows the, the functionality of it. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so you're not banned, you're in the back of a bus. Um, you know, how, how shocking it was for me. Um, so, to, to see that, um, so really interesting things to do there. Um, the units that these are available on are actually only about four. I was going to bring it, and if we were in person, I would, I would hold up this box, so, but I should have brought it with me. It's out in the other room. But, um, but the, you can get a hold of this. This experience is free. The unit that you would put it on is only $400, which I know, okay, only $400. But I'm pretty sure your schools probably have $400 in the budget. I'm sure that they could find this. Um, and if you have any questions about specifically about that unit, it comes in a box. You just need a cell phone or a tablet to run it on, and away you go. And for $400, you can take this trip. Um, you can go back 50 years and see what it's like to be an African-American trying to navigate the South. Um, and to me, that's super cheap. I mean, that, that's, that's a steal. I'm um, $400 to be able to do just this. Um, and that's one of like a hundred things you can do with it. 
So, uh, so please, if you have any questions about that specific, you know, please let me know. It's called the Oculus Quest. It's a really nice device. If you don't know how to use it, just find it. It's easy. It, it, you can't break it. Well, you could, um, but you won't. Personally, I think it's a good time to be an educator. I'm um, just sort of wrap things up. Um, it's exciting. You know, things are definitely, we are having to pave new ground here. Um, and I wrote that before uh, this all happened, um, that it is a cool time, that we, we have to be explorers right now. Um, we don't have to be, you know, that sometimes I, I tell my, my students, my uh, children about this, they're, of course, out of school too, I'm having to go online. And I say, hey, um, there was a time when Benjamin Franklin had to save his pennies so that he could buy an old newspaper to read by candlelight. And he became brilliant doing that sort of stuff, right? He became Benjamin Franklin, one of the greatest writers ever. Frederick Douglass had it even worse, right? At least we're not in that situation. Frederick Douglass having to challenge white children to games he knew he was going to lose so he could pick up new uh, vocabulary and letters. Um, you don't have to do that. You know, yeah, maybe we have to switch our classes to online, but if not for these guys, um, you know, who knows? And of course, uh, we could certainly bring up innumerable women who fought for literacy rights. And, um, you know, the, what did they have to go through? Well, we're kind of in that situation now where we, we've at least acknowledged that humans are equal at this point at least acknowledge that it's not always necessarily putting in practice, but that's the, the dominant paradigm at least. Well, now how can we use these technologies to really, to make sure that we don't have to have kids saving their pennies to read newspapers. We don't have to have kids fighting against oppressive systems. Um, the technology is, it's getting easier to access, it's less expensive, it's more accessible. And now we can take all these people and make sure that really anybody can get a hold of them. Um, that how are we gonna reach those students who are locked in their house? It's really forcing all of us right now uh, to, uh, uh, to um, embrace and understand how the challenges that we all face, how can we still be connected when we're not necessarily allowed to leave the home, to not necessarily get in the same room with each other. There's still ways to do it. And to me, that's kind of an exciting time. So um, uh, so ultimately, this uh, using these technologies, it will improve your organization and efficiency. Um, it will boost your creativity and your innovation. And it will develop new ways of reaching your students and accomplishing your goals. Um, so, because uh, we all, of course, have our goals and uh, things we want to get done, well, this, these are tools. The, this is, the technology is not the end point. The technology is a step to get to the end point. Um, so I think that's what's really important to keep that in mind, that, that this is just, this is the start, not the end. So that's it. Um, uh, I know I went kind of quickly through that. Do we have questions, comments? Yeah, so there are some questions. And then if you all have any additional questions, as a reminder, you can add that to the question and answer um, panel that's on either the bottom or the top of your Zoom screen. So let's see what we have here. So someone said, very helpful information I had to join Zoom for a faculty meeting. Thank you. Many exclamation points there. Um, and then we have another person who said, how are you planning to implement Zoom for your classes for the remainder of the semester now that you, your school went fully online? Or do you have any ideas on implementation on how to do so? Right. So what I'm doing is, um, luckily, I already had a couple classes of mine were already using Zoom. They were already blended. And so I'd set those up uh, for, because I knew there was particular uh, groups of students who had uh, either transportation or uh, uh, connection, they just couldn't get to the campus on time, they had particular scheduling issues. And so I'd set up two different courses for those groups of students. I was able to identify those groups and set up Zoom classes for them already. So I was kind of fortunate on behalf of my load was already online. For the other ones, for the, for the ones that were face-to-face, -face, what I'm doing is I'm uh, holding voluntary Zoom sessions um, so that I'm gonna, I've set up Zoom meetings, I posted it on campus, and that's our, our LMS, some people are using Blackboard, Blackboard would work too. Um, and so I'm having voluntary ones. And I'm just sort of hoping that enough students come in for. We've only been locked down for a week, um, for uh, not even a week yet, uh, just a few, a few days. And then what I can do is those students who can get in, um, then we'll have a regular class as, as, as regular as we can through Zoom. And then I'm going to record it and post it on Canvas um, so that the students who, uh, and there's ways to do that. I um, mean, you might have to talk to your Canvas administrator, but there's ways to stream it um, on a Canvas so it doesn't eat up a whole bunch of data, doesn't need, they don't have to download it. And, uh, uh, and then so the students who can attend, um, or maybe just choose not to attend, they can still have the information to them. They can still at, at least see a recorded version of as normal a class as we could have. Um, it's far from ideal. It's not going to be the same as requiring somebody to be in the room with them. But at least they can still see a class function. Um, so the, the sessions are voluntary. I posted the, the meeting link up there, just like how you got into this meeting today. And then I'll just hit that record button. And uh, then they can, uh, they can have the class available to them. 
And then another question is, we use Canvas on our campus. Can I use Zoom on Canvas? Question mark. Do I use them separately? I'll be all new to online teaching. Yeah, so they're, they're two separate things, but what I do is I create, a, in that video, um, I have another video that'll show you how to upload it. I can, I can send that link out uh, to, to people who want to see it, because I have a video about how to take your Zoom recording and upload it to Canvas. Um, if your school uses Kaltura as part of Canvas, so if you've heard of Kaltura, um, there's one way of doing it. If your school doesn't use Kaltura, there's another way of doing it, um, and I can help you out with either one. Um, but yes, yeah, so what you do is you go into Zoom, and then you record it. Um, you record your class or your presentation because you don't have to have other people there. You can just open up Zoom and record a presentation even if nobody's there. You don't have to have it, uh, have a group. Um, so either way, and then you just download the video and then just upload it to Canvas. And there's going to be a couple different ways of doing that. Um, it kind of depends on your setup, um, but it's it's not difficult um, by any stretch. If you can if you can download and run Zoom, you can you can download the meetings and put them on Canvas easily enough. And so what I do is I put them in an announcement or a my favorite is to put uh, recorded videos, um, either a presentation or a meeting ahead of students, put it in discussions, um, and then have Nick, uh, require the students. I think uh, one of the instructors is not familiar with um, Kaltura, if you want to share a little bit more sure. on that. Um, all that is, is that's an add-on for Canvas. Um, so it's, a lot of schools are using it, but if you, if you don't, then you can still just upload the MP4, um, which don't let the name scare you if, this, if you're new to this, it's, it's a file, okay, it's just like a, don't, don't let the name MP4 bother you. It's just a file. You're just going to download the video, upload it. Kaltura is something that your school may have. And if they don't, don't worry about it. But if they do, it just allows it to convert a little bit easier. And it will also add captioning, um, which is really nice that it immediately puts it in closed caption for you. Um, so for students who do have uh, uh, audio issues, um, or maybe the instructor has um, uh, presentation issues or whatever, you, know, you can put that closed captioning on there. If your school is not using Kaltura, um, this is an outstanding time to tell them to add this to Canvas. So they have to pay for it. They have to come up with some money for it. But it does allow your students to get that closed captioning. It's just a part of Canvas um, that your school have put into Canvas for you. And you just have to find it um, wherever it's embedded. And we'd probably have to, um, I'm happy to work with people one-on-one. -on -one. We keep in Zoom together. And I could maybe uh, track it down for you. Um, but it's a part of Canvas. Um, if you don't have it, you don't need it. Um, you could still put your video up on Canvas on its own. I mean, if the school is not going to come off the resources to also purchase Kent Kaltura. Any other questions for Nick? I see the Q&A has a few. Um, okay. Okay, just this one. Um, but yeah, please, um, I've been, there's a Facebook group, uh, Pedagogic Pandemic. There's a, a Facebook group of, of academics. Um, I've been on that too. And I've been exchanging some ideas. I've been working on this for a few years, almost like, like this is almost kind of my moment, right? Um, to um, the technocrats are, are going to rise mm -hmm. up. Um, I'm happy to to work with folks. Um, so if you if you do want to say, hey, look, I, I just don't know what the heck to do. Ever. Um, no question, stupid, right? I mean, if it's something where sometimes people have said sheepishly, like, I don't want to, I don't know how to do this. How do I do it? What else are we going to do, right? I mean, we're we're here to learn now. We, we the instructors, we get to be students now again, and um, we get to learn now. So I'm excited to, um, to see if we can save the day on this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and as Nick mentioned, if you do have any additional questions for him, um, we're happy to get you all in contact. Um, and if you do have any questions directly for us, please email them um, to marketing at hawkslearning.com. Um, we will also be emailing you a link to all the sessions at the conclusion of our virtual summit. So thank you, Nick, for all of your time and thank you for all the registrants for participating. Yeah, thanks, everybody.